All right. Well, let me uh, swap this out <clears throat> with this fancy newfangled technology that we have. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. Shabbat Shalom again to everybody. Um, when I um, looked at doing this sermon, what I wanted to bring here, my thesis was about about this saying that I had first heard, I know I've said this before, I heard Zig Ziglar say it the first time. And <clears throat> it goes that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care about them yeah. first. And I, I remember um, um, having a conversation with somebody once. I was born in, and raised a Jewish in a, in a Orthodox neighborhood and you know the Christian boys would come through and, and my grandfather wasn't very tolerant with them. And, and he'd be like, I go out and beat those kids up when they come through the neighborhood. <clears throat> and, you know, they weren't trying to witness. They were just trying to be nasty, and so were we. And, and I, I thought about, about how we, we are not in a position. We, first of all, we don't convert anybody anyway, anyway. But we're not even in a position to share our own personal story, um, our own testimony, until we really start to build a relationship yeah. with, with other people. Um, just a couple stories. I remember on a, I was on an airplane once, and I um, <clears throat> don't know where I was flying, but I was sitting in the aisle seat, and there was a lady in the window seat, and we never really talked. I, I'm not much to start a conversation with people anyway, so we just were on this couple and a half hour flight, and as we came into the initial approach, which is about 20 minutes before the plane lands, uh, she looked at me, I, had, I was reading my Bible. I had, at that time, not my phone Bible, but an actual physical analog Bible. So people didn't think I was texting, they actually thought you were reading your Bible, because you were. And she started talking to me, and she was on her way to um, a funeral for her son who had just died. And she was just beside herself and devastated. She didn't have any, any belief in anything, really, and we talked for that next 20 minutes on the way into the ground. And when we landed, I gave her my Bible, you know, and said, look, I don't know if you'll ever read this or not, but I promise you, if you do, you'll find comfort. You know, it's not gonna change things, but you might find some comfort in it. And I know that, that had I started that flight by just leaning over and saying, hey, do you know Jesus? Hey, you want, you know, you read the Bible? That it wouldn't have happened. But even the 20 minutes of conversation of, of you know, me trying to provide or find deep inside me some empathy <laughs> to, um, to talk to this lady was a way in which to do it. And I know that there have been other Jewish friends of mine and people that I know that there's no way you could ever share with them. I couldn't share my conversion story with them until I had a relationship with them first, you know. And I know I had tried with some people a couple of times and they don't want to hear what you have to say. The paradox of this is that here we are in this whole pandemic mess and we're told to stay six feet away from each other and everybody wears masks. And I thought up close and personal, maybe that, I don't know if that's the title that this should actually be. Because right now everybody just wants you out of their face and out of their space, you know. And, and, but I, I still believe that we have opportunities um, to, to carry the message of Jesus Christ and, and we have to do it by first building relationships with other people. I really think that's true. Um, I don't think people care what we have to say, again, until they know whether or not we care about them. Acts 3, 6 says, Then Peter said, Silver and gold do I, I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And remember, Jesus met these physical needs of these people first, right? He he established a relationship with them and with the people in the communities, and he was trusted, and people had faith. I think the only story in the Bible where that wasn't the case was where he took the man outside the gates. What, what was the name of the city there? Um, and when he first um, uh, touched him to heal his eyes, and he said, what do you see? And he says, I see what looks like trees, remember? And the reason that he wasn't healed right away, and then Jesus says to look up, was because he didn't have 
the faith that was necessary to be healed. But Jesus built that relationship with these people, and we should take a note of that. Witnessing is a foundational, um, axiomatic criterion of being a Christian. So if I'm a Christian because I love Jesus, which I do, but my only goal in being a Christian is that I get to go to heaven and experience eternal life with Christ, I think I'm missing a huge part of what my purpose of a, of a Christian is. If that was the case, we wouldn't need ministries and missionaries or any of that. We would all just kind of be like, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Do you know? Well, that's unfortunate, you know. And we'd be moving on our way. But that's not what it's about. I can't be in this for the reward. I have to be in this for the commission that I have, which is to carry the message to other people who are suffering, like I was suffering before I found Jesus, so that I, and again, I can't save people. That's not what I'm saying, but I have to be able to plant that seed so that the Holy Spirit can do the rest of the work. And that, that process of being a witness, the, the, the process of us carrying the gospel message is a foundational requirement of being a Christian. It's not just being a good person and doing good things and, you know, uh, it's got to be about bringing other people to Christ. And all of us are evangelists. Every single one of us has some evangelistic tool in our toolbox. Some people it's for speaking. I enjoy speaking, and I believe that that's a gift that God has given me, speaking and, and, and teaching. And I know in Natalie it's music. And even when, even when she's not up here, I've been on prayer group with Natalie when she has started singing during our Bible study. And that is her ministry, and it brings people's hearts closer to Christ. For some people, it's financial support, right? That they might be able to support ministries um, that are out there that are doing the Lord's work. But we also have to be knowledgeable about Christ. We don't have to be Bible scholars. None of us have to be theologians. At this time and place, the way our universities are going, I don't even recommend we send our kids to our Adventist schools anymore, you know? But we don't have to be theological experts. In fact, I think that's probably a detriment sometimes because we get into too deep thinking about things that we don't need to think about rather than just listening to the word of God. But we have to understand and know Bible truth. That's a requirement for us. We should read our Bible. We should pray. We should do Bible study. We should go beyond just the emotional aspects. We have to have an intellectual investment in understanding what, not just the concept of religion, but the context of what it means to be a Christian, what our roles are. And then we can share our own personal testimonies with other people. Look, everybody here is here today for some reason. I, I don't know what your reason is, you know? Uh, some of you I do. Some of you I've talked to about. Others, I don't know what your story is. But everybody's got a story. Something brought each of you to the cross. And I would be willing to bet that even if you were a lifelong born into the faith Adventist, that you eventually came to the cross on your knees. I know that I did. I didn't come um, to the cross celebrating because life was great. I came because it was my last resort I had before I probably took my own life. And, and, and the stories that we have, we're told that God comforts us with the, the comfort that he gives us is not so that we can be comfortable, but we can comfort others with the same comfort that he's given us. Again, the therapeutic value of one sinner helping another is without parallel because we are the ones who understand what another person is going through. Um, so we have a part to play. Hey, hold up your shovel, Carol. I want to see that. Where'd you get that from, Bonita? Do, do, from the hospital. I love this. I, I, can I see your shovel from it? This is great. Well, if I can find it. Here. So this just says Advent Health on it. I don't know what else it says. Emergency Department Expansion 2009. Anyway, sorry. So I guess this is a groundbreaking shovel, right? But when I saw this, I thought of a saying that I had heard. And it says that faith will move mountains, but you have to bring a shovel that we have a part to play. We have a work that we have to do. I'll give this back to you. <laughs> Maybe. 
Maybe I'll use it again. We have a big part to play in order to bring this whole thing to a close. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, we also, also, so it's not just saying me, it's saying we also, in addition to others, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, right? Remember in Revelation, it says that the angels will come, that they'll come as a cloud. Have you ever seen like a cloud of birds? I have a video I'll show you one day when I was driving out to South Dakota and I was in some place where they didn't have any hills. It was just this flat area. And I think I called Susan, I told her about it, and I stopped and I pulled over and I got my camera. I actually took the drone up and I flew the drone up to get in with these birds. And I took this video and these pictures of it. And it almost blackened out the sun. It was like dark clouds had come over. There were so many birds and it was deafening the sound that I've never seen anything like it in my life. And we have this great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight. What does that mean? Take a deep breath. Lay your stress, anxiety, and burdens aside for a moment. And the sin which so easily ensnares us. Step away from that for a minute. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And that race that is set before us is making it to the end. Looking unto Jesus. So, so again, in context, this isn't something we can do on our own. If we don't keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, we will stumble and we will fall. The author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We got to get out of our little pity parties and stop feeling sorry for ourselves. I've been experiencing this. I have this stupid feeding tube and it's already fallen out once and it's a pain and I can't sleep with it. And last night I turned and somehow it got snagged and it hurt so bad it popped me up out of bed and you know I have like PTSD with this already. Wine, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> but here's what happened when I was in the hospital. I'm a walker. I walk. 20,000 steps a day. I'm walking the hallways. I think I told you this when I get out. And every room I looked into, people were in really bad shape. I have nothing to complain about. Because I'm like, on a scale of 1 to 100, I feel like I'm a 50. But when I compare myself to the general condition of the average person in this nation anymore, I'm 110. Witnessing goes two ways. Um, this is uh, from 1 John 1, 1 to 3. It says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may fellowship what? With us. Witnessing isn't just about telling other people about the message of God. It's about what? It's about listening to what other people have to say. It's not just about me telling other people my story. It's about me getting motivated and excited because I'm listening to other people tell me their story of what brought them to the cross of Jesus Christ. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. So... If I have any wisdom at all when it comes to, to carrying the word of God, where does that wisdom come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit. And if I'm not open to listen to the witness that comes from other people who the Holy, through whom the Holy Spirit speaks, then I will never have an effective message to carry to other people. But like we started this, when, we, when I started this out, Relationships are the key to making this whole thing work. Our relationship with Christ, that's the first thing that we have to work on. From Steps to Christ, page 104, Ms. White writes, the relations between God and each soul are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. Amen. Do you feel that way? 
Some days I don't. Some days I feel so unworthy that it's beyond my mental capability to imagine that God, that Jesus Christ actually went to the cross and he died that horrific, tortuous death just for me. If there was nobody else, he would have done that just for me. And that requires me to have a, a better esteem about myself, but it's not a self esteem. It's not what I think of myself. It's how I believe Jesus Christ sees me. It's what God thinks of me. Because if I rely on what other people think of me, I'm just going to be in the dregs all the time because there's no way any of us, you know the old saying, you can please some of the people all the time and all the people some of the time. I believe you can't please anybody sometimes. Right? What was the story? The, the waitress, this is, I can tell this because this is... <laughs> Because I'm Jewish, so it'd be like if I was black, I could tell a black joke. But I'm Jewish, I can tell a Jewish joke. But it was like, it was this, this waitress who goes up to the table with these four elderly um, Jewish ladies there, and she goes up after waiting on them for a while, and she says, so ladies, is anything okay? You know, so uh, we have to work on our relationship with Jesus first, and then we can work on our relationship with other people. In fact, if you look at the commandments in the in the first part of the commandments, it's building our relationship with Christ. It's, it's working through our relationship with ourselves. It's building our relationship with other people. Uh, Leviticus 19.18 says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against any one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord, uh, the Lord your God. Who is our neighbor? I can pull the verse up. Who is our neighbor? Wow. Right? What's it say? Um, um, do you remember, Sean, what's the exact wording on it? Um, how does it go? I, I'm so sorry I forgot it. Where Jesus says, who is my neighbor? And he defines that. Who does the will of my father? Yeah, you who does the will of my father. Thank you. It's, it's, get some more involved, but that's what it is. That is my neighbor. We defend those who need defending. i, I got to tell you the funniest. I found this. I found this thing that says, don't worry, I got your back. And I thought that was kind of cool. And then when I, when I looked at it, I went, wait a minute. I thought something happened when I imported the picture that that stick figure wasn't there. And then I realized it's really not his back, it's his spine, if you want to be specific. But, but then I realized what it meant. I got your back. It meant he physically had it. And I thought if I had to explain that to you, I probably shouldn't have put the picture up there. So I apologize, but... But uh, we defend those who need defending. I, I, I just tell you a quick story. S Susan remembers this. This is way back when we lived in Clearwater. This goes back 25 plus years. And um, um, I guess I thought I was a bit more of a more bad than I was, than I feel I am now, for sure. <laughs> but we were at the, at the car wash out on the Dunedin Causeway. You remember this? And a car came screaming up into the car wash and this a uh, woman jumped out screaming, and this man jumped out chasing her around the car, and he grabbed onto her, and I ran over there and, and yelled at him that you better stop now. And then he looked at me and said, well, what are you going to do? I never even thought that far into the future. <laughs> I'm probably going to let you beat me up in front of my family, and I don't think you can handle that emotionally. You know, I don't know <laughs> what to say in that case. But... But I said, well, I've already called the police and they're on their way. And he got back in his car and he drove away, you know, and she took off. So, look, there are people out there who need our help. They need us to intervene in situations that they're in. And sometimes it may cost us our lives. Yeah. But so what? How many here want to go to heaven? And what is the transitional part to that? We die, right? Even, even those who are alive in the final coming are transformed. That is the death of our physical bodies. What is it we're afraid of? Maybe we're just afraid of getting beat up and being in the hospital for months and our jaws wired and in a halo or something. I don't know. But, you know, Jesus even tells us that what greater gift is there that we would be willing to give our lives for a friend? I can't think of a better witness than, as a Christian, than not to be afraid to give your own life, to help somebody who's in need, you know? I mean, we, giving the shirt off our back, but 
Do we have their backs? Is the question. Acts 15, 36 to 41, or I'm sorry, Acts 15, 36 to 37 starts this. It says, then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit. Well, let me set this up. This takes place um, uh, before Paul left on his um, second missionary journey, right? He and Barnabas, um, they were getting things together and planning out the relevant details of the trip. And um, they had this disagreement about whether uh, John Mark uh, should go with them. Because in verse 39, it says uh, the wording is there arose a sharp disagreement. It's one of the few times I've seen wording like that that was in, in the Bible. Because what had happened, Mark left them at Perga, right? Now, there is, um, uh, you can go read this, and there are some people who say uh, he went back and he was dissing the message. He was saying, hey, this isn't true, and they're preaching to the Gentiles, and this whole process is a mess and it's wrong, but there's no consensus whether that was really true or not. We don't really know what happened, but we do know that he left them, and that um, um, uh, Paul in particular uh, found Mark to be unworthy, that he was a poor character, and he basically didn't trust him to take him back out on, on the mission field. So then it says, and then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city uh, where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. And Barnabas was determined to take with him uh, John called Mark. But Paul insisted they should not take him uh, with them, the one who had departed them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them uh, to do the work. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. So this is just one of those situations where um, I don't know what, um, what Mark did, but he messed up big time. Big enough that, that these two guys are like about to go to fisticuffs from the sound of what the interpretation is. But, but what happened instead? Uh, Barnabas came and he had his back. He defended him. Everybody deserves a second chance. And so he decided to take him with him. And he stuck up for him because he needed somebody to be there for him. We comfort those who need comforting. You might want to mention that at the end of Paul's life, Mark was there with him. That's true. That's right. At the end of Paul's life, Mark, he was loyal. He was a loyal friend, and he was there with him. That is true. And, and who knows? Who knows that that wasn't the time? Who knows that that one seed we plant of trust in another person when nobody else trusts or believes in them, if that's not the one thing that brings that person to Christ? Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. 1 John 3.16-17 says, By this we know love. Because he laid down his life for us, need we say any more? And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? So, what, what God saw our need for salvation. Okay? What was his donation to us? What did God give us? He gave his only begotten son to a terrible, horrible death. Because he could. Because he loved us so much. What is it that we're not willing to give to somebody else if we have a brother or sister in need? There is nobody in this church who should ever go wanting for anything that they need if there is another brother or sister who's capable of providing that for them, ever, under any circumstances. Because if that ever happens, we are placing greed in front of God. Whatever we have becomes an idol, and that is such a dangerous place for us to be. If if God was willing to give his only begotten son, Abraham was going to do that, remember? What are we willing to give as well? The more personal the relationship, the better. Um, Ellen White writes this. She says, The spirit of the true shepherd is one of self-forgetfulness. 
he loses sight of self in order that he may work the works of God. By the preaching of the word and by personal ministry in the homes of the people, he learns their needs, their sorrows, their trials. Do you, do you see this building the relationship, a building a personal relationship, learning and knowing about another person, what they need and what's going on in their lives? It says, and cooperating with the great burden bearer, he shares their afflictions, comforts, and their distresses, relieves their soul hunger, and wins their hearts to God. In this work, the minister is attended by the angels of heaven, and he himself is instructed and enlightened in the truth that makes wise unto salvation. That's Acts of the Apostles, 527.2. And one-on-one -on -one is always the best. So here I'll read you my... Well, I have lots of favorite verses in the Bible, so this one ranks up at the very top. Here, here's, here's the context. They're out in the desert, and the tents are all set up, and that um, the pillar of smoke is there, and, and Moses walks down this long aisle between the tents. They have the tribes and the families. And there's 2.8 million people out here. And he's walking down this long aisle. That's how I picture it. The Bible doesn't say that. You're welcome to have your own vision of it, but that's how I see it. And he goes into the tent of the tabernacle, and the cloud descends over the door, which is a sign to everybody, do not disturb, right? Because he's now in there with the Lord. And this is what it says when he walks into that tent. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Wow. I remember hearing that the first time when my grandfather read it when I was nothing from the Torah. And I was just amazed by that. God spoke to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. You know, I know everybody's got their own idea. When you get to heaven, what are you going to do? Oh, I want to ask this, and I want to ask about that, and I want to see this, and I want to go there. And I'll, I've even joked about it. I just want to take about a million years and sit in a rocking chair on the porch of my cabin overlooking the fields and seeing the sheep laying down with the lions, right? But what I want to do is I want to talk to Jesus face to face, just like I talk to a friend. That's how I pray, you know. When I pray, I pray just like I'm talking to a friend because Jesus is my friend and my Savior. Also with other people. John 1, 40 to 42 says, One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. Wow. Isn't that great? One on one. He didn't go out there and preach to the multitudes. He went one on one to his brother and said, I found the Messiah. You have to come with me. However we find people, we have to share the love of Christ. Here was a word, this is um, from Ellen White again. This is from, um, what's DA? I forgot the initials. Desire of Ages, sorry guys. There's, have you ever looked at all the initials for all of her books? Okay. Uh, this is from Desire of Ages, um, 340. It says, here was a work for them to do, to go to a heathen home, and tell of the blessing they had received from Jesus. How's that? Huh? Cool. Go to a heathen home. Wow. <laughs> somebody who doesn't believe, the Gentiles, and tell them about the love of Jesus. But they bore in their own persons the evidence that Jesus was the Messiah. What does that mean? They probably didn't even have to open their mouths. Yeah. The people in that home knew that they had Jesus in their hearts by the love that they expressed and the openness and the acceptance that they had of those people. They could tell what they knew, what they themselves had seen and heard and felt of the power of Christ. You never know when you will be the first time that anyone has ever seen Jesus. You are a witness for the Lord, whether you like it or not. Don't tell anyone you're a Christian unless you're willing to act that way because they will judge all other Christians 
by your behavior. And for Pete's sake, don't tell them you're an Adventist. <laughs> if you're not willing to abide by the doctrinal teachings of the Adventist church. I'm not saying that there's some legalism to this part of it. That's not what I'm talking about. You know, we have the three angels message and how we talk about the state of the dead and the Sabbath is important to us as a mark, right? If, if, if we can't abide by those principles, don't, don't tell people you're an Adventist because you know what's going to happen? They're going to judge all Adventists by that. So let's wait until we're ready. This is what everyone can do to those whose heart has been touched by the grace of God. And in closing, Doris, our policy, I believe, should be attraction rather than promotion. I know we go out and we hand out books and we stand on the corners and we talk to people about Jesus. Have you found Jesus? Have, you know, what's your relationship with God and all that stuff? But I think that the more effective way is that of attraction. People see, they sense our, our peace and our tranquility and, and our, I don't know, our sense of it's okay. And they want that. In, in this world that is so filled with anxiety and strife, people are just freaking out and losing it over everything. I think they're seeking out people that, where they can be a safe haven. People who are not freaking out. You know, I, I think it was Zig Ziglar who said this too, but he said you can tell more about a person in a minute during a crisis than you can tell the rest of their lives. How do we respond when the whole place goes up in flames. You know, who are we when it's all falling apart? Are we out there yelling and screaming with everybody else and throwing things? And, and I'm not saying that, I'm not commenting on protesting. I'm just saying, are we the ones that are law abiding and calm and peaceful and that people look at that and say, man, I, I want a piece of that. You know, I want what that person has. And that's how we attract others to Jesus. Not all can go as missionaries to foreign lands. That's kind of good. I have this rule, I'll go anywhere that doesn't require a passport. So, so I'll say things like, oh Jesus, I'll go anywhere but Hawaii. <laughs> Just to test it, and it hasn't happened yet. Not all can go as missionaries to foreign lands, but all can be home missionaries in their families and neighborhoods. There are many ways in which church members may give the message to those around them. One of the most successful is by living helpful, unselfish Christian lives. Those who are fighting the battle of life at great odds may be refreshed and strengthened by little attentions which cost nothing. Kindly words simply spoken, little attentions simply bestowed will sweep away the clouds of temptation and doubt that gather over the soul. The true heart expression of Christ-like sympathy, listen, given in simplicity, not a sermon, maybe just a hug, maybe just being quiet and listening, has power to open the door of hearts that need the simple, delicate touch of the Spirit of Christ. Amen? Amen. Thank you. I have no idea what's going to happen beyond that. That's not my job. Our job is to plant the seed, right? I plant the Palos waters, and the Holy Spirit brings the increase. So that's my challenge to you this week. One person. Hey, nice outfit. I don't even know if you're allowed to say that anymore. I, I don't know. Nice dog <laughs> or whatever, you know, somebody at the checkout lane. Just find somebody and just form a, a relationship with them. And then just let it happen. See what goes on. We okay with that? Yeah. All right, we'll close in our usual manner. For those who are, haven't been here before, my grandfather always closed the Sabbath with the Aaronic blessing. That's from uh, number 6, 24, 24, 25, I think, and 26. And he does it, in he, he did it in Hebrew. So I'm going to do it in Hebrew, and then I'll, I'll do it in English as well. So if you'll bow your heads with me. Ibracha Adonoi ve'ishmarecha ya'ar Adonoi panavalecha v'ikunecha. Yisaw Adonoi panavalecha v'yashamlecha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and bring you peace. And everybody said? Amen. Dismissed. Thank you, everybody. You're welcome to hang around. Uh,
Sean's going to be here for Bible study afterward. Take a few minutes and get your head together. I got a uh, trivia.